Oh, hey, uh, I think I just realized people can probably hear me or not. Okay, hi. Hello. Let's uh, wait a few minutes for some other folks to join. Do you guys hear the crying in the background? No. Okay, good. It's one of my kids. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Oh, I just I just kick my kids uh, outside to the living room. Are they are they old enough to handle themselves outside? Uh, his mother is doing this. So. Oh, his mother. Their mothers are okay. Uh, yeah, I've got the mother is with one of them. He's he's super sick. He's got hand, foot, mouth, and thing. And the other two, one of them banged her head on the floor. Uh, so, just, so. just twenty minutes ago. Oh, no. oh, that's terrible. Not to hijack the conversation. Do you think, do you guys think it's okay to ping people with like at here and on Slack? In the... um, absolutely. Why wouldn't you? I would just do channel. Oh, okay. Wait, channel pings everyone, right? Everybody in the channel. Yeah. Oh, well, that's pretty hardcore. Okay. Yeah, but, it's, but they're in the NLP reading group. Right. I mean, like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> this is a, that's the best reminder possible. Hey, you want to come join? Come join. Okay. I'm going to send them that. If anyone complains, we can just kick them out. Uh, and I think you can schedule those in advance. Okay. Uh, notify 39 people across 10 time zones. Um, <laughs> Well, Santa, we'll try once. Uh, <laughs> Generally, the, the, it's definitely not the best to do channel, but um, I think this is the appropriate. Yeah, and, and like people literally probably have their name signed up. Uh, Akhil, hi, we haven't met before. If you, if you want to do like a one minute long introduction of what classes you're taking and- uh, Hello, everyone. Hope you can see me. I am Akhil and I am doing, uh, um, what is that, PSL this semester. PSL, got it. Yeah, I have done um, 412 and 420. I think- Sorry, uh, oh, sorry go ahead. Raj invited you, right? I think. Yes, yes, yes. We both are in, in the same group uh, actually doing the assignments. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And I think you are doing one of the assignments or course with him, right? Yeah, I'm taking tax information systems. Yes. Yeah. Class and I'm, yeah, I'm going to be doing the private thing. Hi, Dinesh. Hi, Emily. Hi, um, everyone. Hi. Yeah, I feel, I always feel better that it's so late for you. Emily, if you want to do like a one minute introduction about yourself, what courses you're taking, uh, the kind of stuff, since this is your first time joining. Uh, and you're very welcome also. Uh, hi, okay, sure. Um, just a short intro. Uh, my name is Emily, and I wasn't here for the last meeting, uh, but uh, I tried to catch up uh, on the recordings. Um, and I'm currently a full-time student, so taking three courses this semester, doing um, this one in NLP, and then, um, also along with um, software engineering and data curation. So if anyone else is in the same course, I'm happy to connect over that. And yeah, pretty new to reading research papers. So just hoping to join in, learn something. Um, yeah, I think we got enough people to uh, get started. If anyone joins later, that's great. If not, that's also great. Uh, so I'm going to send a link onto the chat, and then maybe it's, um, it's better that everyone has this link opened while uh, they're reading this uh, paper. So I think the approach uh, I'm going to take today is the uh, I will give a brief introduction to the paper, um, and then we'll break out into a different section, and then each of us will actually read one session and do a brief uh, like review and presentation afterwards. Uh, so, because like this is a survey paper, uh, it is not uh, that in depth in terms of like introducing a particular model, but it's beneficial that uh, we understand that 
the questions that the researcher is facing while doing their literal language processing uh, research and how they are going to adjust them. Uh, in this paper, it's naturally not like in-depth explanation on this approach, but it's really well structured in a way that like they will just spread out the entire issues, the landscape, and there are like multiple methods to adjust each of the issues. And then uh, I will, like, because we have like seven people, I think like there were seven subsessions. So it's actually better for us that like each of us will read one subsession and then like concurrently. And for example, like for 10 minutes and afterwards, uh, we'll ask questions about like what this problem is about and what is the uh, methods to adjust this problem and what is the remaining issue. So I think this is the format that I'm going to take the, the for today. So did, did, was, sorry, the one thing like uh, maybe tell us what the introduction is about uh, before we read the subsections. Yeah. Um, so we all have some context. Oh, sure. So can, can I see my screen? I think the host has disabled the screen. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so bad with Zoom. Uh, let me see how to do this. Uh, uh, multiple participants can share. Okay, try try once again. Uh, okay. okay, I can see. Why can't I? Okay, so let's share my screen. Can I see my screen now? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, there's a link on the uh, on the chat, and you can open the paper directly. So I think basically this paper is about um, a recent approach for language language processing in low resources scenario. Um, so I think like the the main point is like low resource scenario. Like from from what I read it, what is about low resources. Um, actually, when after reading this paper. Uh, it's not about like low resource, low hardware resources. It's not about hardware resources. It's about like the language resource we use to change the model. So we talk about like natural language processing on English language, but the English languages uh, is the most resourceful uh, language in, in the language system. Um, sorry, sorry. Can, you, can you reshare? I adjusted the settings and I think we lost your screen. Uh, can you share once again? I think it should work now. Uh, okay. Wait. Okay, I, I, I can see it now. What about others? It's working, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can see. Okay. Uh, yeah, so. So the main uh, research issue that addressed by this paper is that how to train models or do natural language processing on low resource languages. So as we know that like, oh, like English as a language is, actually has a lot of resources because like billions of people are speaking this one. And then the languages is really well documented. Um, like you have YouTube materials, you have textbook in English. So the, the body of, uh, text is really abundant for English. And then it hands are, it, so we can see that this is like the high resource language, a special focus on English, this one. Is. But however, like there were other languages on earth that people are speaking about, but they didn't get enough attention as in English. For example, like there is a uh, Sino-Tibetan language called like Yongningna, I think there's like 40k um, speakers and only like 3,000 sentences has been So like how to uh, do NLP on those languages is really challenging the way that like you don't have enough material to train the model or to, to yeah, to do like the, the modeling and also the estimation, right? Um, so, so this paper is about like, okay, in this scenario, we have low resources. How are we going to do NLP on that? I think in a way that like it is, this paper is not um, like directly like addressing what we are going to learn in this course 407. 
but I think it is actually uh, addressing the peripheral of the NLP engineering as a whole, from like how to generate enough data to actually like do the NLP engineering. So the next question, the, the paper is going to address is like, what is low resources scenario? What is low resources? And this is actually adjusted in the third section of the paper. And it has like the time, the, it explores the three dimension about what is low resources. The first one is that the availability of task specific labels. So not many languages has the written text and even less languages has written text with labels, right? So in order to train a um, language model, you need to have labeled it, uh, text to do the things. But what about like, task specific? What does it mean? Um, so it actually means that um, in order to actually like infer some meanings or syn syntactic from the language, you need some to, to apply some task. One example is that, for example, you want to um, to de disambiguate a language and sentences. Then you need to do like dependency analysis, syntactic dependency analysis. So we may need to actually uh, devise a set of labeling to do such a uh, uh, dependency analysis. One example is these sentences on show on the screen. Uh, for example, like this is an uh, ambiguous sentence. On the phone can refer to the friend and also to uh, Ernie, right? Whether Ernie is actually talking on the phone or his friend is talking on the phone. For example, you need to have some um, labeling. And this is one example of task specific labeling. Another task specific label labeling can be like, uh, location, for example, like Eiffel Tower, Tiananmen Square, those kind of like uh, location uh, labeling can be another task specific, specific labeling uh, task. The second dimension is that the language itself is actually uh, low available, not available. For example, a language that is actually like spoken mostly like a dialect, for example, but there's not many documented way of like transferring the languages. So the second one is that, okay, the language is not available at all. So the first dimension is language available, but the labels are not available. The second one is that, oh, the languages themselves are not available, right? And then the third way that the resource is low is about the auxiliary data is, is, is not there. That means uh, like the availability of the uh, auxiliary data. That means the, the knowledge we need to generate labels from the language is not available. So this, this kind of resource scarcity makes like creating language model for those languages really difficult. So how are we going to uh, do machine learning, like natural language processing on those languages without a lot of resources. And the paper uh, give us some of the research currently we have to, to adjust this. And then the, the session on the fourth session and the fifth sessions uh, presenting each method and their shortcoming. So this is like the task we are going to do that each of us will take one section and spend 20 minutes waiting at it, and then uh, answer two questions. One is, what is the method is about? The second one is, what is the issue associated with this method? So each session uh, will contain uh, one columns of text. It's not that much one question. And then after 20 minutes, we will present one by one, a brief idea, to, a brief answer to these two questions. So, so there were seven sections, seven subsections uh, to address 
each of the method to address uh, the low resources issue. The first one is data augmentation. So how to create a lot of data sets. And then there is another method called distant and weak supervision. So I think the definition of what is distant and weak supervision is actually mentioned in the session itself. Third one is cross-lingual annotation project, projections. So how to map from one language to another language, given that we have like well-known model in one language. The fourth one is about learning from noisy labels. Like you don't have like a high quality labels for one language, but instead maybe we, we have some like really noisy label, how can we actually like utilize those labels? The, the fifth one is pre-trained language presentation and then domain specific pre-training and multi-language model. Uh, this one, the, the fourth session, the first, first four sessions are about uh, data documentation. And then the last three sessions is about like transferring amongst the uh, language models. So since we have seven people on the channel on, on the chat, maybe we can actually assign one for each people. Um, do you have any preference? Otherwise I would just like use the sequence I see on my screen, then map it one one to one to the no preference from me. No preference I'll find with whatever. Okay. So I make a screenshot, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so this is like the sequence of maybe uh, Waho can do data augmentation, Ilya doing distant and weak supervision, Wash uh, Krishnan is doing cross lingos annotation production, and then Dinesh is doing learning with noisy label, and Emily, you are doing pre trained language representation. And a queue is doing a domain specific pre training. And I will do a multi language model. So, yeah, so I think uh, 20 minutes uh, is a reasonable time frame for us to read uh, the single session once. So, usually it's just a half a page. And then I think that the paper is structured in a way that uh, uh, it's not hard to find an answer or. What you want to do, maybe you want to add. Sounds good. And then people can uh, duly raise hand reaction or whatever reaction. Okay. When uh, ready. Could you just for a second go back to the name list? Yeah, uh, that's what. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Uh -huh. So I will mute myself and then. And just to just to clarify, um, do you feel it's it's necessary to to? I haven't read the paper yet. Um, that we need to go through the intro or the first three sections prior to reading our section? Is there anything besides what you just told us? Uh, I think the most important part is you need to know about the motivation of doing those methods. I think like the first three sections is about the motivation part. Right. Uh, so as long as you understand that, okay, why do we need to this method, then you are fine. So the, mo the motivation is there's, there's a lot of missing information about how to process it and potentially even just missing language. Yes, yes. Like the, the material we are going to train on is not that abundant in other languages. And there are scenarios that we don't have a lot of labels, that kind of things. I think this is addressing like not the modeling part, but also like, but, but how do we prepare the data to feed into the model? Sounds like a familiar topic in ML in general. Yeah. So I think like uh, in our course, I think like the, the materials are prepared for us, but I think like there's a lot of work to be. Yeah, you're lucky for that. Your, your oh. connection is cutting out every so often. And so we're losing a sentence or two when you're speaking. Okay, so while we are reading, uh, let me sign on another laptop, see if I can have a more stable work in the net. Okay, thanks. So uh, I will give ourselves and then we'll come back at 240.
Just a reminder, there are two minutes uh, remaining. So we'll uh, summarize answers to the, the two questions about each section. Uh, I think for the time being, we have 20 minutes left. We have seven people. I believe that uh, each of us can uh, control our time on two, two to three minutes. Um, and then to ensure that like everyone has a chance to speak out. All right. So uh, the next section is about data augment, uh, augmentation. Uh, while doing the augmentation part. So I'll just mute myself and then okay, go ahead. All right. So <clears throat> uh, if you guys can pull open your paper to that section, I'm just gonna leave my notes on the screen. Um, so there's a number of methods that are being used that are referenced here for data augmentation. Um, I think I want to get to like the, the end first, which is, you know, typically, um, you know, open issues are that data augmentation is not widely being used in NLP. Um, and so the, the main, potentially the main reasons are it does require very specific domain knowledge of the language. And uh, there's no unified framework across all the different types of tasks you can do in the languages that are available. And you're getting the same performance potentially by using pre-training with a transformer model. <clears throat> so it tends to be something that may be the most viable with um, maybe these less frequently, uh, le less frequently used languages. Um, where you can leverage the expertise of domain domain experts, um, or if you have limited hardware resources. Um, but you know, given that context, that's the current standard. Um, so there's different ways of doing it. So you can start at the token level, and you can simply swap out tokens with their synonyms. Um, so there's one paper that references that. You can do something called um, you can swap out entities of the same type. So I actually grabbed an example. So I didn't quite understand what that meant. Um, so this is from the reference paper. So they're changing out this date with a different date and this name with a different name. Um, here they're changing out Canada of Japan with Bush administration, again, a date and a name. So those are the entities. So swapping those out gives you whole new sentences that you can use to augment your data. Um, additionally, you can um, words sharing the same morphology. So I, I believe that means the, like the conjugation of a verb or um, how it's being used. So that's on the token level. On the sentence, you can change out entire sentence fragments. 
uh, depending on the task, as long as the meaning does not change. Um, you can also simplify the sentence, removing structure, uh, inverting the subject and object relation. Uh, I didn't get into whole sentence back translation, but I wanted to see what that was. But here's an example of uh, the type of swap. So basically, the original sentence is she wrote me a letter, and then you can crop it and she wrote a letter. So that can still be a valid sentence in the, in the language. And then um, I guess she, me wrote a letter, I guess could be valid in some languages, but it's just rotating things around. Again, this is the whole purpose of this is just to have additional uh, samples to work with. Um, they're also trying out different things like uh, adversarial methods, which are common in C computer vision. So you make small adjustments to the vectorized representation of uh, the data. And uh, according to some score, as long as it meets that, uh, so meets that, that right threshold, then uh, it can be additional data that you can use. And the example was given that you could actually create grammatical mistakes by changing it enough and then flipping the label and then using that as additional data uh, to work with. Um, so that's it. That was in the data augmentation. Any questions? Thanks. So like to summarize, this is uh, data augmentation is about uh, substituting from the sentences to make additional data. And then um, it is actually, the, the shortcoming is that maybe you need like domain languages uh, expertise to do the substitution. You, you need the expertise of the language and it is, um, it's not necessarily that much better than using pre-trained transformers, which, you know, I, I don't quite understand what that is, but it sounds like it's, it's almost off the shelf. You can just grab one and then make use of it. Mm -hmm. I agree. So yeah, so I think like, because this is like a survey paper and then I think the, the language itself doesn't necessarily go so deep into like what it means. I think it's that is it serves a really good like starter on like uh, future research direction if you are interested in these specific topics. And I think uh, we can actually move on to the next speak section about distant and weak supervision. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm not going to be sharing my screen. I'm just going to verbally try to explain that the idea is pretty simple. So you have your um, data, which has no labels or a few labels, and then you decide that um, you do not have the resources to manually go and label this data, but you are fine with having some trade with making the trade offs, the trade off of having this data imperfectly labeled. And what you do is you go and parse some publicly available things like dictionaries in the language or encyclopedias in the language. And you uh, figure out things from their like lists of uh, locations or lists of names in that language. And then you go back to your data set and you use that uh, data that you just parsed from publicly available sources to um, label parts of your data. You obviously won't be able, label, be able to label everything. You won't be able to label anything perfectly, but you can still take like some things and do what's called name entity recognition, right? So if I see my name in the text, we could label that as that's a human's name. If we see a New York being referenced, we could rec recognize that it's a, it's a city just by knowing that, by having a predefined uh, list of cities in the world, in the language. And that's uh, generally possible to do because there are, those things are kind of publicly available. You can also use the same ideas for uh, part of speech tagging, then the thing, things like relationship extraction, which is semantic dis disambiguation we've talked about uh, in the class. Uh, so this is the method. Again, the idea is use sort of this crude approach from publicly available data to do named entity recognition and accept the trade-off having perfect labels. Um, why it's not used much or what's the issue with it is that it's imperfect. You have to accept the trade-off. Also, it just does not have much of a popularity in NLP. It's a very popular approach in some other ML tasks, but not in NLP, uh, apparently. And um, the paper says that um, this approach could gain popularity in the future. 
Um, yeah. So let's see the preview. Uh, and this, so this approach is called uh, weak or deep supervision, right? It's weak because you're you're accepting the lean perfect labels here. Uh, sorry, not deep, and distant, distant. I misspoke. Yeah. Yes, thanks. So it's about like using external data source to to do the labeling, right. even though it's not perfect, mm -hmm. but is good for like no resources uh, situation. The next up is about session 4.3, cross-lingual annotation projections. Hmm? Yeah. So it, it has a really fancy name, but I think like taking an example where this was done manually might be a better start. So that's a case where we had the Rosetta Stone, where we had like a particular piece of text given in like three languages with like Greek along with some Egyptian languages, which hadn't been translated, but we knew that they were the same message across all three and people were manually going through it and then were able to decipher at least some of the hieroglyphs by looking at comparisons across the three types of text. And this particular case almost like takes that and projects it into the NLP zone because you can see that okay, we have a piece of text that's the same in two languages. So we can train something in the first language, which is like high resource, and then project our learnings into the low resource language. So that leads to a really powerful thing because you have a lot of data, but you can pretty certainly interpret like what's actually being done. But it also comes with like several downsides, which we can get to in like the issues part. And like alongside just doing like this type of translation, it's also used for like going from a language which does something better. For example, like being able to express some type of sentiment or I think it's called telicity out here, which is like what kind, like is some action complete or not, which cannot be done well in certain languages. So like English, while it's regularly a high resource language, does not define certain things well. So to be able to do something in a language that does something well and then project it into a language which does not is also like a valid use case out here and helps us like glean information across languages. So that's pretty much how it works. On the side of the limitations, it does come with issues in that you need to have the same text in both cases and you're relying on a machine to be able to like just go from one to the other so it might have made some completely random connection, which is not at all accurate, but yeah, like that's one of the like inherent downsides of machine learning. And the other part of it is that you're generally restricted to something like religious and political texts. Political texts as like the Rostra stone itself was in what can be, what's available in like multiple languages. So it limits what type of corpuses are actually available. And there's a few things that are coming up now on like maybe doing it in a more restricted manner. So just comparing like individual words through dictionaries and pieces like that. So it almost touches on the stuff that Ilya covered previously. And there seem to be like commonalities across both of them. Great. I had a question. So, hey Raj, I had a question. So is there any mention about popularity? So popularity, like I didn't get like that part hadn't really struck out too much. There are like a lot of papers mentioned, but yeah, didn't get anything explicit on popularity. Just just as a point of discussion, maybe like, you know, if you don't like in ancient texts, obviously you have to have, a, you know, the reference of the material, but maybe a modern day equivalent is like Netflix movies with the different translations that are being done manually. And um, maybe yep. those will be used. Mm -hmm. especially if it's like manually done and like not just transliterated then like that would be a really valuable resource for sure like yeah i've not thought of that part at all like that's really good thanks for summary and then last would be the learning with noisy labels oh uh, yeah so uh this was uh i mean uh this has a lot of information and uh, a lot of you know methods are mentioned within one paragraph only. 
I'm not aware about every uh, method. So it might be possible that I would be scratching the surface. So bear yeah, with me. So so I think this is the, the, the purpose of the survey is that you, you know like more, like to broaden your, your knowledge boundary than like, okay, maybe you don't know this concept, but like you can try to explain it. Yeah, so, uh, so the, you know, uh, the most uh, in the first paragraph this, uh, I would go by line by line so that people have, you know, uh, can see in the research paper as well. So as this line mentioned, it was one of the few important excerpts. It tells that it can hurt the performance. So the main idea was that if we have noisy labels, then eventually we'll have uh, maybe wrong understanding and maybe translation and all those NLP tasks, and hence we'll have a performance hurt. And then uh, on this line, uh, so, so the, it, as it says that the noise handling methods diminish the negative effect of distance supervision. So uh, the point like distance supervision is like uh, not having that much clarity on the labels. That's what I have understood in this uh, quick readout. And uh, so what noise handling is trying to do is that trying to reduce the negative effects of distance supervision. So we need sometimes distance supervision, like maybe in previous tasks as well, um, if you are, they had come across uh, distance provision is required. So, especially in the case of unlabeled data. So, so what the two methods are, the first one is noise filtering and the other is noise modeling. So first one is the noise filtering and uh, what it eventually does is that either uh, it removes or uh, like it tries to remove. It's not able to remove, but but yeah, it tries to remove and these are done on various ways and methods as we can see here. So first one is a classifier. So as it's mentioned here, there can be a binary classifier. So what I have understood is that basically uh, we'll have a corpus uh, in which we'll have the correct words as well as the noisy words and we'll have a classifier that will learn what are the correct formations and what are the wrong formations and then they would classify as a noise or not. And, uh, and the another one, another one is the probability threshold. So I'm not sure about this, how probability is assigned and what's the process of assigning probability of being correct or being a noise. So this is something up to uh, maybe you guys can read later, but the main idea is that like, uh, as in this week, we were going through probability model. So there should be some sort of uh, probability assigned to uh, the token that comes after a few tokens. And if that probability is very low, then uh, uh, that threshold is set and those words are treated as a nice. So this is the one method that I can uh, quote here. And the other is on uh, use of reinforcement based agents. So uh, reinforcement based agents, I was going through this uh, research paper quickly and I could get that they're uh, learning some sort of on distance supervision only. And uh, once the learning is done on that, I mean, I can just scroll through that paper. Oh. Distance supervision. So, yeah, we can, we can we can actually confine our uh, description from, from this paper, and we can uh, yeah. So we, I, I okay. think I, I agree with you that like uh, this this session is actually like really abstract that in a way that like the label itself can be wrong or can be noisy. I think like it, it introduce a, a different layers of uncertainty into the language modeling problem. <laughs> This is what I what, what I what I think while I'm reading it as well. Okay, so, cool. So uh, that that's that's about filtering, I think, majorly. And one one crazy one was also attention measure. Uh, this this attention is really uh, gaining traction nowadays, as you all know, in transformers. So I don't know how they are using attention to uh, filter out uh, the noise, but yeah. So uh, the other one is modeling the noise. This is also a very interesting idea. 
So what they are trying to do is they are having a confusion matrix and they are estimating the relationships between that actually depicts the relationship between clean and noisy, clean and noisy labels. So there would be a matrix and uh, it would be maybe on the x axis they would have the clean labels and the y axis they would have the noisy labels and they might have a strong correlation or weak correlation between them. So if uh, on the basis of that, if there is word that has appeared and it has a strong correlation, it might not be uh, maybe a noise and uh, it may be some form of it. So that's the idea. That's what I've understood. So uh, the other thing is that uh, in this is that, yeah, this, this point, this is very interesting. So basically what it does uh, is that it actually a uh, noise model is getting appended and it is being used uh, to train some sort of let's say model and it's actually done on clean label distribution which is unseen so what eventually is learned by the model is that on a clean label distribution with some noise it is able to distinguish what are the clean and what are the noise so eventually as you can see here this is the this can be interpreted as the original class by being trained on the clean version of the noise label. So it is aware about what are the clean labels as well as what are the noisy labels because it started seeing the clean labels, then it appended the noise on its own and started classifying them as noisy. So it somehow knows about clean and noisy both. So it really helps. The last thing is now skip to the end. Uh, this uh, again, that distance supervision labels tend to be false negatives. That is the mention of entities that have been missed by automatic methods. So uh, this again mentioned, there are few papers mentioned here. So what it actually is trying to say is that name entity recognition is a process in which the noise uh, indistinctly supervised tends to be false negatives. So we are trying to remove those false negatives of distantly supervised. And there are some approaches like latent variables and uh, I think constrained binary learnings. So these are really, you know, um, I think very, you can say esoteric. I'm not aware of these things. Maybe guys can later read on. So these are the few ways. The first one is then filtering and the other is modeling. So I hope it helps. And any questions? Yes. So, okay, at a high level, just high level, right? So there's two ways that we said to learn from noisy, noisy labels. Yeah. Okay, and then so just 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 could you repeat it? Because there's a lot there's a lot of stuff in that embedded in all in all of that paragraph. But at the highest level, can you explain again what are the two approaches? Yeah. So I went into details uh, so that uh, it's less maybe intimidating since. Uh, later on, you'll try to read it. So on a higher level, uh, if I say it's actually two ways, like you mentioned, first one is noise filtering. What we are trying to do is, yeah, we are trying to, um, we already somehow know about what are the errors, what are the noisy labels are. We're not going to, you know, um, maybe have some learning on the go. We'll all, always have some static resource, which we'll compare to and then we straight away filter them. And uh, yeah, and noise modeling, what it does is that it's actually modeling the noise. So you can fill, you can fine tune it. So what you can do is that um, in, in ML also, I've seen that there are noisy target functions and all those stuff. So if you change the noise models, you know, next time you ran on the data, you might get a different output. So oh, so that's becomes how, a hyperparameter on the modeling to say, look, we're going to yeah. model the noise. And then based on that model, we're going to accept yeah. or, dis or not accept a certain amount. So yeah, we are modeling binary. the noise. Okay, you're modeling the noise. Okay. Yeah, we Got are combining it. two models. Like the first one is the actual model, and the other would be the noise model. And that two together would create a new model. And that would help to understand what are the noises in the. So maybe if you change the noise model next time, on the next one, you will have a different output. So that's the reason. You, you you became more versatile in that case. Makes sense. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you there for your in-depth uh, explanation. Yeah.
Hey, go ahead. Okay. What, what is the other? Sure. Okay. Yeah, so the next section is about uh, free chain language representation, part one. Um, yeah, so this section, um, actually, I feel like the whole section about transfer learning, it's a really huge uh, field that's also becoming very hot nowadays. And um, so the section, I think 5.1 is just serving as an opening or intro um, to, I believe, the next two sections, which um, talk more about like how, how it's applied in more detail. Um, but as mentioned before, um, I think uh, the idea of using a pre-trained model and kind of transferring it to a, a different task is just to take like an existing model that's trained on like other data to solve um, a similar problem. So like um, one example of that being like transformer models such as uh, BERT, right? So the idea is that a trained, uh, a pre-trained language model um, like if it's already trained on a huge body of unlabeled data, then it's already like to some extent learned the language um, through high quality word representation. So, so um, the section gives uh, a bunch of examples there. I, I ran out of time to kind of look into each individual one in more detail, but some examples were like subword based embeddings. And the idea is that the um, pre-trained model already kind of has a grasp of the data. And then if you take it to use, um, sorry, a grasp on the language. And then if you take it to use on downstream tasks, say like, um, it has a smaller and more specific data set, uh, may, maybe it's more like a, a domain specific language, um, then it'll um, have, like using the pre-trained model will um, be essentially like a booster to the performance. It, it'll be like really good for um, like performance um, later on. And so the two issues that um, the paper cites uh, that are like open issues with this method is that um, the first one being large hardware requirements. So now we have transformer model sizes booming. I believe like BERT has millions of parameters. And I think uh, they also cite GPT-3, which has like billions of parameters. And so the idea now was low resource languages. Um, what if not only data is low resource, but hardware is also low resource. So then going over um, a couple of methods to um, uh, kind of address that. Um, and then the second issue um, they cited is that data quality for low resource languages um, might also be like a lot worse than those from a high resource language. So maybe it might be like, um, I guess like more preferable if we just had a very small and curated data set with high language quality versus kind of using a large set of unlabeled data that um, we're not in that like we're not sure the data quality of or the data quality is uh, really low. And so yeah, that's the overview um, idea of what I got from the section. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, so we can, if you have more, more questions and we can actually like discuss it like either, either after the session is finished or like this, like because uh, we are a little bit running out of time. Uh, now we go to the second last section, which is domain specific pre-training. Are covered by RQ. Yeah, so in, in here, what we are kind of talking about is, um, you know, the, we do have kind of these models available that kind of work with a lot of um, standard kind of data. Say, for example, text data, web um, data, and stuff like that, news data. But still, uh, there are large gaps where we have got very domain specific stuff. Say, for example, um, a scientific uh, paper or something where we have got a lot of symbols and some lot of scientific information. So how to manage that kind of information, um, how to come up with a, with a model that is able to kind of uh, give you the desired results. And this is what they are calling as a domain gap, uh, gap because you have got like very domain specific stuff and you've got models which are trained on very general uh, kind of uh, um, data. So one of the solutions, what they are talking about is uh, what we can do, we can fine tune the domain specific stuff. So uh, uh, what we can do is um, uh, train the model with the domain specific um, data. So one of the examples that they have given, there are, there are a lot of kind of details in this section as well. 
so BERT is uh, one of the models that Emily talked about earlier as well. So if you have a domain specific data and then you uh, use BERT, you will get some good results. That's what they are saying. But if you train uh, the, uh, if you use the other model, which is kind of bio BERT, which is trained mostly for the bio uh, field and the sci BERT, which is trained for the scientific area, then you get better quality of the results. So <clears throat> this is where they are talking about like, you know, the domain specific training and then utilizing that, uh, that model uh, to kind of do uh, 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 further kind of predictions and, and, and stuff. Um, and further down, they're talking about um, uh, combining the, uh, you know, the high resource, uh, um, uh, high resourcing model, like, like the web kind of content or news content. And then with that low resource embedding from the target domain, like scientific domain or the bio domain. And then after that, you can create a meta embedding. And from that, you can try to get the better results. That's what they are, they are explaining. And further down, there are other papers uh, which are linked in there. And there is one more thing, if you see last three, four lines, which is talking about, uh, you know, the further improvement on this can be done by aligning embeddings trained on diverse domain using an uh, adversarial uh, discriminator that distinguishes between the embedding space spaces to generate domain invariant representation. So this is this is more kind of, uh, you know, you want to train the domain specific things and bring in and combine with the general, uh, you know, general data trained models and try to get the maximum results out of those. This is what it is talking about mainly. Thank you so much for the very clear explanation. Uh, so I will take the last uh, few minutes about the, the last section about like multi language models. So basically, like it is some language model that's uh, for a specific uh, task uh, is first trained on a high resource languages and then applied to the low resource languages. Given that like these languages can have similar uh, mapping from the surface form to the feature form vectors so that like they can be they can fit into the same neural network model, for example. So the issue is like the multilingual model are actually far from universal. So like there's like, uh, I think, the, the, the people mentioned that only one third of the uh, widely spoken languages are actually uh, included into like the multilingual spread model. And then like there are some languages that are actually like more suitable than uh, to, to use this method than the others because the distance kind of like the, some distance is actually shorter from the uh, high resources language we use to change the model. I think like the, the sum, to summarize it, I think it's about the uh, if we have like a lot of uh, languages, high resources, and then we uh, create the same the same feature vectors, and then um, and then fit into like a model. The model itself has uh, some space. Uh, they refer into like the, the paper that I haven't like dig dig too deep into like the details. That is like called multilingual space. Uh, I think it's kind of like a feature of the models that uh, can take in multiple languages, for example. And then to finish us uh, uh, a specific task. So I think this is like what uh, it's uh, mentioned about in the, the final section. Uh, so I think uh, so. I have uh, chopped out some notes while you are speaking. Um, I will share it onto the, the chat. Uh, in case uh, I, I miss something, uh, feel free to actually like fill in a gap. And then I think like this can be like our, our meeting minutes uh, for the day's meeting. So uh, I think like this. Uh, this paper is just served as a start. Uh, it uh, provides some interesting topic about like how to uh, do NLP in low resources languages and also like the domain specific languages. And then it contains a lot of pointers to uh, reference paper. Uh, I think like if you are interested in a specific topic and feel free to actually like uh, uh, dig deeper into the chain of a reference. Uh, as you can see, like the paper itself is only nine pages but like uh, another 16 pages is references. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I think uh, hopefully you learned uh, something new today and then uh, yeah. So feel free to discuss anything you want. And I think uh, uh, we have used up our time 
And then uh, this okay to give it back to you, Lydia. Ilya. Yeah, uh, this was fantastic. I I think we can close down the session if or if people have any questions or want to discuss, feel free free to. Uh, Nothing to discuss, but I just didn't want, I wanted to mention, I think there was something called Byte 5, which is Google recently did a paper in June on byte-based, uh, a more updated version of byte-based transformers rather than token-based. <clears throat> um, and so that's B-Y-T-5. Um, there's a, here, I'll, I'll post a, I'll post a link in Slack for the, the Google search for it. So you guys can see. Um, some, some modern or recent, recent stuff on it. Cool, thank you. This was great. Uh, thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye.